Dunkirk, 24 days after Germany's invasion began, under skies that rained down Nazi destruction, Allied forces make their last stand on Belgian soil. The Battle of Flanders has been lost. All resistance has collapsed behind them. The Belgian king has surrendered. Germany's enveloping methods have separated their armies. But English and French troops, who rushed to stem the invader before he could reach France, still fight desperately to hold off the advancing enemy until the bulk of their comrades can reach this one remaining channel port. It is a race, a grim race, the grimmest that ever faced any expeditionary force. But into the race comes the sea power of Britain. Dive bombers are defied, shot down. Battleships blast broadside after broadside as their big guns come to the rescue. Germany boasts one million Allied troops captured in Flanders. To this, England's guns roar in grim defiance as scores of Allied divisions huddle under fire in a Dunkirk that becomes a raging inferno. Bolts of every description, from warships to pleasure craft, cross the 20-odd miles from England to bring their men back home. Sea power defies air power. Under withering fire, soldiers wade and swim from the unprotected beach. England wrests glory from military defeat. More than 300,000 of our fighting men and those of France are saved from Germany's grasp. Alarms sound over Paris. Nazi bombers attack in earnest. Gendarmes herd pedestrians and traffic to shelters. Shelters like this where Parisians await in stoic calm while bombs wreak havoc above them. Wave after wave of swooping hawks. With dreadful warnings of the fate ahead hurtling from the skies. The homes and streets of civilization turned into a battlefield as German columns reach with claw-like thrusts toward Paris from the north, west, and east. Nazi bombers deliberately throw fear and destruction into the populace, totally annihilating whole towns in their unabated reign of destruction. Hospitals are not spared. Paris and her suburbs suffer their first bitter taste of war from the air. The French make a desperate lone stand against the advancing Nazis. Their resistance is fierce and mobile. France's toll on the invading troops is terrific. help cut off and the Belgians surrendered, France chooses orderly retreat. A new strategy of offense tears great holes in the defenders' lines. General Degon tries to trap these plunging tanks while the main armies retire to better position for a decisive battle. Caught between ever-closing pincer claws on either side, these poilus of France maintain their morale as they move southward in the hope of a concentration that will give effective halt to German advances. Dive bombers constantly hamper the march, and refugees cringe and crouch in ditch and field as enemy planes fly low. Endless columns of civilians choke the roads, all under fire as the highways are shared with fighting forces. Refugees by the hundreds of thousands from northern France, from Belgium, women, children, elderly people, thrust into a blank future with every tie to peace and the past 
torn from them. Farther and farther, faster and faster, the enemy penetration proceeds. Towns and villages in their path are doomed to smoking ruin. Far beyond the Marne, turning point of the last world war, far to the rear of the Maginot Line with advancing throngs that dash toward Paris from the east. On, on from the north with incredible swiftness to a point where Paris can be seen with the naked eye. And from the west, other Nazi divisions surge toward the capital. Cities, towns, farms, whatever lies in the way of every approach is laid in waste, caught in the invader's pinching attack. In the fury of the assault, church spires crumble into the debris of nothingness. But every inch is hard fought. Germany pays dearly for its gain. France's air aces challenge the oncomer. A last frantic effort is made to retard the enemy. France's airmen sight a German supply train and off start the deadly missiles to check that part of the enemy advance beneath them. Another batch is released and far below a direct hit is scored. Every branch of French arms is in this rear guard action. Infantrymen undaunted by their task, unexcited by news of Italy's belated entry into the war, make their way to new posts in trenches from which they expect to slow down the speed of enemy encroachment. French artillery gets the rain. And the shells of their guns scream toward the crowded enemy's rear. Skirmishes and counter-assaults by French infantry hold the rear guard, protect the retreat. Men outnumbered 10 to 1, but still making a last heroic stand while their government moves from city to city. French tank meets Nazi tank. Fierce encounters, bitter resistance, bravery against overwhelming odds. Final hour in the Maginot Line. Encirclement has rendered it useless. The famous port's guns roar for the last time. The battle here is over. Orders are speedily given. Signal sound and evacuation of the once proud fortress is begun. As the men of the mighty garrison hasten to escape certain capture if they remain, the people of France are asked by their new leaders to lay down their arms, to stop the fight. Marshal Pétain becomes French Premier. 38 days after Germany entered the lowlands, he sues for peace. The terms of the Axis powers are accepted. Near this beautiful city of Paris, saved from destruction by being declared an open city, under the conqueror's heel, France's new adventure in government begins. The once gay Paris beats to a new strange tempo, facing an unknown tomorrow, with only her world-beloved buildings, monuments and treasures preserved for an uncertain future. <laughs>